In uh, this lecture, we are going to cover descriptive statistics, which is um, a way to take data and then use them and then compress them into a few numbers which represent the data. So, this is the basic concept that we work with. We have a population and we want to know about the population. And the population is basically everything in the world. So, if we want to characterize people in the world, it means all people who have ever been is now and will always be. So this population we cannot work with, we cannot uh, measure all of them. But what we can do is we can take a sample from this population and independent sample. So instead of having all the people in the world, we take out six people. And on these, we calculate some statistics, the mean, variation, standard deviation, and so forth. And these statistics uh, are the ones we refer to as descriptive statistics. Then a part of statistics is also to say, well, these statistics from the sample is useful for describing the population as a whole. And this part of going back to the population is called inference, and that's another subject. So for now, just descriptive statistics, which are over here. So the learning objectives for this is that we should know the terminology for what we do descriptive statistics on, and that is to know what a response variable is and what an explanatory variable is, know what univariate, bivariate, and multivariate data is, know that there are two me main concepts in descriptive statistics, which are centrality and dispersion. What do we have? of measures to characterize centrality and dispersion and how they calculate it. And then if we have more than two variables, we can talk about correlation between variables. And that is also, um, we're going to touch briefly upon that. So the terminology for the descriptive stats is that a response variable, that is something that we measure or observe. So that could be, for instance, the water content of a cheese, the alcohol content of a wine, the number of bacteria in a sample, all the sensorical attributes of a given product. An explanatory variable, on the other hand, is something that we control or something that is given. So some examples of that would be type of wine, so red or white wine, the temperature in a fermentation experiment that we control, the type of coffee that we are tasting. So if we uh, want to screen different coffee types, we can buy different labels in the supermarket and it's us who decide which labels we buy and that's also what we're going to test. So it's something that is controlled or given. How much data is there? That refers to the notion of univariate, that is one response variable, bivariate, two response variables, and multivariate, that is if we have more than two response variables. Okay, centrality and dispersion. So centrality refers to the notion of where in the dis where is the distribution approximately. So where is the center of the distribution? So if we take a look here, we'll say the center of the distribution is between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. So that's centrality. And to measure centrality, we have two measures uh, that are useful, usually used, and that's the mean. So calculate the mean of these numbers or take the median of these numbers. That will reflect the centrality. So let's try to do that. The mean of these numbers is 0 0.12. So we see that that is just in the middle of the distribution, which it should be. If we calculate the median, which is the middle observation, that is, if you sort all the observations from the lowest to the highest, and then take the midpoint, that will be the median. So that is 0 0.11, and these two numbers are usually very close to each other. So centrality refers to where are the distribution. Dispersion, on the other hand, refers to the notion of how wide is the distribution. Is it a narrow distribution or is it a wide distribution? So what is the sample's distance to the center? That is how we think about distributions. Uh, so standard deviation or variance are two measures which we can use for characterizing the dispersion. So this is the standard deviation and the standard deviation is the average distance to the center. So we see that there are some which are far from the center, 
for instance, this sample out here or these sample down here are far from the center, whereas the others are pretty close to the center. So the average distance to the center is reflected by the standard deviation. We also have variance, which is closely related to the standard deviation. We could also uh, characterize the dispersion of the distribution by simply just saying, well, it goes from the lowest value to the highest value. That will also give a feeling about how wide is the distribution. We also have something called the EQR, the inner quartile range. And that is how far is that from the lower fourth to the upper fourth of the distribution. Yeah, so here are the min and max for this distribution. And here are the inner quartile range. Um, so we have x1, x2, and so forth. And these numbers are 1, 8, 2, 7. So we usually write up to x1, x2, up to xn. And then this is the number, so we have four observations, so n is four. And now we want to calculate the mean. So the mean, which we refer to as x bar, is equal to the sum of all the x's divided by n. So that the sum of these ones are 1 plus 8 plus 2 plus 7. And that equals to, you know, what does that equal to? 16, 20, 18? 18. That's beautiful. And then we divide by 4. And we get 4.5. In order to calculate the standard deviation or the variance, we need to say, well, what is the distance from each measure, 1, 8, 2, and 7, to the center? So what we do is we calculate the distance, so 1 minus 1, 4.5 to each center. So these guys we have here reflects the distance to the center. So the observation minus the mean, the observation minus the mean, and so forth. Each of these numbers are squared. So we put a square on top of here. And that is, you can think of it as to get rid of the sign because you will have something here which is negative because it's below the, the, the mean and something which is positive, which is because it's above the mean. So we calculate all these differences here. So this will be 3.5 and minus in front and to the power of two. So here we have all the numbers squared. And what we do is we take the sum of those. So what is that? So we take the sum of the individual observations minus the average squared. So that is these four parentheses. And that returns us, in this case, 37. So this is sometimes referred to as the sum of squares, uh, SS. Or S S Q. Yeah. When we have the sum of squares and we need to calculate the variance, then we simply take the sum of squares and divide by how many numbers that we have. So that is 4. But in this case, we subtract a little from the 4. We divide by 4 minus 1. And we subtract 1 because we have used the data to estimate the average. So we take the sum of squares and divide by n minus 1. 37 divided by 4 minus 1 and that equals to 12.3. And this is the variance.
if we want to get the standard deviation, then that's simply just the square root of the variance. So in this case, square root of 12.3 um, which which equals three point five. So if we go back and look at the numbers, we say, well, we have numbers. They are one, eight, two, and seven. That is our numbers, and the average distance to the center is supposed to be this number down here, 3.5. So that makes sense, right? So the center is 4.5 and there's some above and they are approximately 2 and a half above to 3 and a half above. So that's the standard deviation. Let's see how this can be done in R. So what we have here is a data set so I'm just going to read it in. So what we have is coffee samples. Um, there are 312 samples and 12 variables. You can just take a look. So what we have here is coffee served at dip different temperatures and assessed by different assessors. And what we would like to know is how the behavior of the different sensorical attributes like liking, sourness, bitterness, and so forth are reflected as a function of, of temperature. So we could, for instance, calculate the mean of liking, for instance, at one particular temperature. So the function to calculate the mean here is we say cough mean and then we put in a vector of whatever we are interested in, so liking for instance. So the mean liking is 4.5.3, however that is across all the temperatures. We can specify, well we only want it for the temperature 31. And then we will get that the liking for the lowest temperature, which is temperature 31, is 3.6. There is a useful tool in R, which is called Aggregate, which takes in a data set and say, well, I want to aggregate this data set according to some subsetting vector. So it's coffee that I want to aggregate and I want to do it by subsetting across temperature like this and then it needs to be specified which function that we're going to use. So here we want to calculate the mean across all these um, different temperatures. It says that there must be a list so we list in front of here and then we'll get a new data set which we call coffee AG and here we write it out on the screen. So what we have here is a small data set we can see that is only six observations but that makes sense because we want to calculate the mean into subsets of the unique temperatures and there is six different temperatures that is 31, 37 and up to 62 and then we get the mean for across all the assessors within each category liking, intensity and so forth. We also see that uh, there are some numbers which becomes exactly the same so male is 0 0.42 and female is uh, 0 0.57 and that's simply just because this is not varying across temperature it's the same people that we use for assessing all the different temperatures. Okay, this figure we want, these numbers we would like to plot. There is a nice version, a uh, nice function here which is called matplot and we want to plot against temperature which is in the first, so on the x-axis we want 
temperature that is reflected by this one. Um, and then we want to see all the response variables. So that goes from 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 6 to 11. So if we plot this one, we will get the diff different values for this table plotted. We would li like to see it as a line. So here we have the response profiles for the different attributes. Now it seems like something is going up and something is more stable. So we would like to see how what, what is stable and what is not. So what we have here is we plug on to this some text which reflects the cult names of this variable. Um, temperature judgment, liking, intensity up to female male. We only want it to 11 here. And at the position, which is the position out here at the end. So column six, that's the, or row six of this matrix. Row six of this matrix. So if we do this again, we'll get on the plot. Sweet gets fairly low ranking, so it doesn't seem to be a sweet coffee at all. And it's not really varying across the serving temperatures. The ones that are varying is the temperature adjustments would make sense. And furthermore, the liking. So it seems like the coffee is more liked when it's served at higher temperatures. Um, sour seems to go down, intensity seems to go a little up. So aggregate here is a nice feature to do a lot of the calculations of the mean and um, other descriptive measures in a fast go. And I'm just going to show you briefly that if we change from mean to, for instance, the standard deviation, that we'll get something which is different. So we do exactly the same. And we get this plot here. Let's just see why we don't get these ones on. Uh, because they're not the same name. So if we do this, we get, now it's the standard deviation. So within each temperature, we calculate the standard deviation among the assessors on the rating of bitterness and sour, for instance. So what we see here is that there is high standard deviation on bitter and sour, which basically means that the assessors are not very much alike in a, in assessing these attributes. On the other hand, the liking and intensity have a lower standard deviation, so they are more in agreement, the different judges, about the rating of the liking and intensity. We also see that judgment, temperature judgment goes up, so it becomes harder to judge at what temperature the coffee is served when it gets hotter. And that makes sense because we are usually best at judging temperature around our body temperature, which is down here. And when it gets warm, it's harder to, to feel with your mouth. Well, this is exactly 50 degrees or this is 60 degrees.